This is Matthew Cratters, Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about hardware wallet pin problems. And this video is inspired by a question, just subbed, am I missing something? What is stopping anyone with a stolen or confiscated hardware wallet from recovering your Bitcoin? This is what hardware wallets look like. This is the cold card Q, which is my favorite hardware wallet at this point. Also the Blockstream Jade is a great product at a lower price point. Hardware wallets have three main functions. Number one, to generate your recovery seed, that 12 or 24 words, using true randomness, using a true random generator. Never ever pick your own 12 or 24 words because they will not be random enough and your Bitcoin will be stolen. Number two, hardware wallets keep your recovery seed, this 12 or 24 words, safe and hidden and offline. And number three, they also allow you to sign Bitcoin transactions to move your Bitcoin around without having to rely on anyone else without leaking your recovery seed online when they sign a Bitcoin transaction. Another way that they keep your recovery seed safe is using what's called a secure element. And the cold card Q and the Mark IV have two different secure elements, which are chips basically from different vendors, from microchip and from Maxim. And these keep your recovery seeds safe inside the hardware wallet and make them extremely difficult to extract. This 12 or 24 words, you may have heard it referred to in different ways as a recovery seed, backup phrase, mnemonic phrase, BIP39 seed phrase, which is the Bitcoin improvement proposal where this came from. Recovery phrase, these all mean the same thing, which is basically it's a human readable version of a very large random number. That's the master key that unlocks all the other private keys that are used to unlock addresses and move your Bitcoin. So your recovery seed says 12 or 24 words, and anyone who has these words in the particular order can steal your Bitcoin. They can move your Bitcoin by signing a transaction. So it's very important never to post these online, upload them to the cloud, take a picture of them, or show them to anyone. So that's your recovery seed. Your passphrase, if you're using one, is something different. This is essentially a 13th or 25th word or a series of characters. It doesn't have to be a word. It can be a number of words strung together, but it's essentially a 13th or 25th word that can be added to your 12 or 24 word recovery seed in order to create a completely new hidden wallet. And by adding a passphrase to your recovery seed, you can really create almost an infinite number of hidden wallets. It's very important to remember your passphrase though, because it will not be stored by the hardware wallet when you power it off. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to help to support the channel. Hit the subscribe button. That really, really does help me with the YouTube algorithm and helps to get the message out. Also click the like button, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. So we've talked about recovery seats, that 12 or 24 words. We've talked about past phrases, the 13th or 25th word that's added. And now we're going to talk about the main topic of this video, which is pin codes. These are used to unlock your particular hardware wallet and prevent unauthorized access, just like the pin code on your phone. This pin code is specific to your individual hardware wallet, and it can be changed if you know your current pin. This pin code is not needed to recover your Bitcoin onto another hardware wallet or other device. For that, all you need is your recovery seed, your backup phrase, your 12 or 24 words, or your recovery seed plus a passphrase if you're using one to create a hidden wallet. All good hardware wallets will not allow anyone to try out unlimited pins. For example, the Trezor will brick itself after 16 unsuccessful pin attempts. The cold card will do it after, after 13 failed pin attempts. And the cold card also has some nice features. It has a couple of trick pins. For example, if you enter, if you set this up and then enter your wipe wallet uh, trick pin, it will totally brick the wallet. So you can do this if someone is about to attack you and take your hardware wallet. You can enter the trick pin and it will erase your wallet completely. I often hear a lot of excuses why people don't use hardware wallets, things that go like this. I'm really scared of someone hacking into my hardware wallet and getting my 12 word recovery seed. So instead, I'm just going to leave it out in the open on a piece of paper or stamped into a piece of metal. Now, of course, it is important to have a backup of your recovery seed that's resistant to fire or water, etc. So metal plates are a great idea. However, a recovery seed sitting out in the open, unencrypted on a piece of paper or hammered into a steel plate is really just like a hardware wallet that's already been hacked and the recovery seed exposed. So you shouldn't avoid using hardware wallets 
for this reason. Alternatives to holding Bitcoin on a hardware wallet that some people suggest, physical cash in a briefcase under your bed. Problem with this is that cash is a melting ice cube. For example, that $1,000 worth of life savings that your great grandfather hid in his basement will now buy you about two thirds of one month's rent if you're lucky, and probably only a quarter of a month's rent, depending where you live. Cash in your house may also may encourage home robberies. So hopefully if you're gonna do this, you have some second amendment tools to back you up and there are very few countries that allow this. Cash in the bank is another alternative that people suggest, also a melting ice cube. And also banks can close for weeks or months in a crisis. The Lebanon banks, for example, closed for many months and people are having to rob banks to get their own money out. And you also might never get your cash back if you put it into a bank or the bank might throttle withdrawals. This is already happening all over the US. You go to withdraw some cash and they say, why do you want access to your own money, surf? You don't have the right to have your own money until you tell us why you want to use it. So that's the problem with cash under your bed or cash in the bank. There's also gold coins or bars in your house. This is a much worse inflation hedge than Bitcoin. It's always underperformed Bitcoin overall long time periods. And also the gold supply increases one to 2% annually. And so you have this dilution of economic energy and it doesn't have this, this fixed supply like Bitcoin does. Also, if you're storing gold coins or bars in your house, your house becomes a honeypot again. It's easy to detect them using a metal detector, for example. It's also very difficult to hide large amounts of gold. And so Bitcoin really is a huge improvement on these cash and gold savings solutions because Bitcoin is much more portable. It's easy to hide in a small hardware wallet or even just store the 12 words in your brain temporarily. Try that with physical cash or gold. Try moving around the country or the world. Try moving across borders and you'll discover how difficult it is to move any amount of money, any significant amount of money. You'll understand what makes Bitcoin so special. There are a lot of people who seem to have this general critique of Bitcoin, and it's really more out of laziness, I think, intellectual laziness than anything else. It, it goes sort of like this. I'm not going to use Bitcoin because it's not perfect. It has XYZ fault. And I have this vision of the perfect money, which admittedly doesn't exist yet, but it's much better than Bitcoin in my mind. So I'm just going to keep holding US dollars in the bank instead. This becomes the default for people who are unwilling to use Bitcoin because it's not quote unquote perfect. So I would say, I like this phrase, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Just learn how to use Bitcoin in a self-sovereign manner, holding your own private keys on a good hardware wallet like the cold card or the Blockstream Jade. The Trezor's okay if you already have one, though I would not recommend buying a new one. The only hardware wallet I would really avoid is the Ledger. I'm not a fan of this product and I'll link to this video so you can see some of the reasons. Again, if you have a Ledger and you've been using it and everything's been going fine, that's probably better than moving your coins back to an exchange or doing a paper wallet or something like this. But if you're in the market for a new, a new hardware wallet, consider the Blockstream Jade or the cold card. And another thing you should consider is imagine your current stash of Bitcoin now 10 exit or 100 exit if the price goes up that much and make sure that you're going to be comfortable with that security solution. If you're holding $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, how are you gonna feel when it's worth a million dollars in a couple of years from now? It's much better to learn how to use the tools now before Bitcoin really skyrockets in price. I hope to release my next video on Friday morning or Saturday morning, depending on my internet connection. So I'll see you then. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe or like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you wanna be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching and I'll see you in the next video.